Well, how much sleep do you really need? You know, some people get too much sleep, and some people try to get away without enough sleep, and some people try to sleep, and they can't sleep. Well, researchers tell us that newborns from birth to three months should get sleep in the range of 14 to 17 hours per day. Their mothers need even more than that, but they don't get that much. And infants ages 4 to 11 months, their sleep range is between 12 to 15 hours. Toddlers ages 1 and 2 sleep between 11 and 14 hours, and their moms would love to be able to get that much. Uh, preschoolers sleep 3 to 5 hours. Excuse me, age, as preschoolers ages 3 to 5 sleep 10 to 13 hours. School-aged children, ranging in ages from 6 to 13, sleep uh, 9 to 11 hours. Teenagers sleep, um, uh, the teenagers between 14 and 17 in age, uh, sleep 8 to 10 hours. But that, they don't get that all in the same amount every night. They sleep 3 hours, 3 hours, 3 hours, and then on the weekend they sleep 12 hours. But uh, it, 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 comes, it balances out anyway. And uh, uh, younger adults as well as older adults, uh, all the way from 18 to, to, to 64, should get between 7 and, and 9 hours of sleep a night. And then older adults, 65 and over, their sleep range is shortened to seven to eight hours because they can't stay in bed that long because of the aches and pains that, uh, that they get. Can I hear an amen to that? I think that's, that may be the case. Well, according to the National Sleep Foundation, sleep is a basic human need, as important for good health as diet and exercise. When we sleep, our bodies rest, but our brains are active. Sleep lays the groundwork for a productive day ahead. And I just want to put a notation in here. If you didn't get enough sleep last night, this is not the time to catch up, okay? Just in case you were wondering. God made us with a need for physical rest. And if we don't get the proper amount of rest, we are going to create problems for ourselves in other areas. Over time, it's going to affect us physically. In the same way, we need spiritual rest. The Hebrew writer uses the settlement of the, of, of, uh, the nation of Israel in the promised land as an example of spiritual rest. As believers, we cannot carry the burdens of the world on our shoulders. Jesus took the sins of the world, including ours, upon himself on the cross. And we are encouraged to hang on to Jesus, trusting him to bring us through the sorrows and victories, failures, and successes of life. And so today, we are going to look at this topic, Hold On, based on Hebrews chapter 3, verses 16 through 19, and chapter 4, verses 19 through 16. The first thing that we want to notice is eternal rest. Eternal rest. The Hebrew writer tells us that there was an earthly rest that awaited Israel. It's the, be the beginning point of his description of this eternal rest, this spiritual rest. It he begins by using Israel as an example uh, of the rest that he has for us. But unbelief kept the people from entering an earthly rest. In Hebrews chapter 3, verses 16 through 19, the Hebrew writer says, Who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the desert? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest if not to those who disobeyed. So we see that they are not able to enter because of their unbelief. The children of Israel were in bondage and slavery in Egypt, 
And they cried out to God, and God provided Moses as a leader to lead them out of Egypt. And after a series of ten plagues, finally Moses was able to lead the the children of Israel over to the Red Sea. But the Red Sea kept them from crossing, and the Egyptian army was right behind them, coming after them. And God caused a great miracle to happen, and the Red Sea opened, and the children of Israel were able to cross over on dry ground into the wilderness that was between them and the the promised land. And once the children of Israel had crossed, the Red Sea closed again, destroying the Pharaoh and all of the Egyptian army at that time. And uh, the children of Israel were on the edge of the wilderness. And after a a, a brief period of time, uh, Moses was instructed to send spies into the promised land. This was the land that God had promised to Abraham uh, decades and and perhaps even a a century before that, that they were to get this promised land. And uh, they sent 12 spies. And 10 of them come back with a negative report, and two of them come back with a positive report. They all saw the same thing, but some of them said, oh, we can't do this. There are giants in the land. It's a good land. It's a land flowing with milk and honey, but they have these big walled cities, and they have this great defense, and we're, we're just out here. We, we don't even have an army. We're just a, a group of people who, who have left slavery. Uh, we cannot stand against them. But the other two said, God has promised it to us. And, and there is a great land there for us. There are walled cities. There are giants. But our God is bigger. Well, the children of Israel followed the lead of the ten who gave the negative report, and they refused to go. And God said, okay, if you're not going to go, then every one of you of this generation are going to die in the wilderness. No one is going to enter into the promised land until this entire generation is dead, except for the two positive spies, Joshua and Caleb, who were allowed to go into the promised land. And so for the next 40 years, the the journey that should have taken them a couple weeks, they journeyed for 40 years, moving from one encampment to another, going around in circles in the wilderness until everyone had died. And all during that time, they moaned and they complained and they rebelled against Moses and they rebelled against God. If you turn to Numbers chapter 11 and read about the next 10 to 12 chapters, all they do through that whole section of Scripture is complain. But it was because they refused to do what God had told them to do. They refused to go where God had told them to go. They failed to obey God. They failed to honor God. They failed to trust God. And and we notice here in what the Hebrew writer says, it is the people of God who lost faith in the desert, not a pagan tribe. Now, if these were people who didn't know God, and people who didn't uh, have an experience with God and a relationship with God, we would understand why they wouldn't trust him. But these are the same people that God had just brought through the Red Sea. These are the same people who were safely on dry ground and watched Pharaoh and the army be destroyed, and yet they lost faith. The people of, of God's unbelief angered God and amounted to disbelief, and the people suffered the consequences of their unbelief. They never were able to go where God had promised them to go. They had gotten out of slavery, but they spent the rest of their lives in the wilderness, craving for something more, craving for something better. They didn't have enough to eat. God gave them manna. They got tired of the manna. God gave them quail. They, they had enough to eat, and they had meat in their teeth, but they didn't have anything to drink, and they cried out to God because they didn't have anything to drink. It was always one thing after another, rebellion against Moses, uh, all of these kinds of things that continued to happen. They didn't enter into God's rest because of their own unbelief. And the Hebrew writer goes on and he says there is a heavenly rest that awaits us. And God promises a heavenly rest to all who believe 
in Jesus as Savior. And we don't have to wait until we get to heaven. Heavenly doesn't just mean that it's another world. It is a, another quality of rest. It's not just a, an, an eternal rest after we die. It is a heavenly rest that indwells us when we follow after Jesus Christ. In Hebrews chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, it says, There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work, just as God did from his. From his. Those who reject Jesus and the promise of the heavenly rest follow the example of the unbelieving Israelites in the wilderness and fail to receive the rest that God promises. You see, the children of Israel didn't receive the rest that they were promised because they didn't believe. And often today, there are those who believe in Christ and, and begin to follow Christ, but hold on to their own way, hold on to their own desires, and, and refuse to trust God and, and to follow after God as they should. In Hebrews 4.11, the writer says, Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will fall by following their example of disobedience. There are other people around us that are watching us, and when we, when we live in disobedience, there are others who, who are influenced of that by that, and, and so we don't want to fail to enter the rest. And so the, the Christian life is not a matter of doing better, working harder, and, and, and trying to make ourselves pleasing to God. But there is a rest that comes when we allow God to have his way. But when we, when we want to hold on to our way, instead of following God's way, there's always a struggle between the two. The rest comes when we finally realize we have a good, good father. And, and what he wants for us is best. And when we yield ourselves to his best, not only to say, I'm going to choose to follow Jesus, I'm going to ask Jesus to forgive my sin, but I am going to seek his will in my life. I'm going to endeavor to live for him. And no one can fool God. His word lays bare the thoughts and intents of the heart. He knows who believes and who doesn't. In Hebrews chapter 4, four verses 12 and 13, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Because of a variety of health issues that I've had in recent years as I grow older, I didn't say I'm old yet, I just said as I grow older, uh, I've had uh, a variety of different diets that I have to uh, look out for. One is uh, high sugar, high carb. Another is to watch salt and those kinds of things. And another more recently because of my throat is, uh, uh, is to avoid high acid, which is next to impossible. I told my doctor if I did everything that all my doctors want me to do, my diet would be I can have all the water that I want to drink. And that's uh, pretty much all that, that's left. But you know, I can, some of these doctors I don't see for months at a time. And I can fool my doctor. I can, I can cheat on my diet and they may not know it. Maybe it doesn't show up in all the tests or all the numbers. And, and uh, sometimes uh, I'm not with my wife and I might be able to eat something I'm not supposed to uh, and my wife doesn't know about it. But you know who I can't? You know who I can't cheat, who I can't fool? My own body. When, when I eat what I shouldn't eat, it affects my own body. And that's the way it is with God. We can say, oh, I'm a believer, I love Jesus, but God's word is true and it's sharper than any two-edged sword and God cannot be fooled. We can tell people we love Jesus we can come to church and raise our hands and be all spiritual, but in the day-to-day -day walk of life, God knows whether or not we are really living in obedience to him, and it is disobedience that keeps us from having the rest that, we, that is promised in God. You and I have a choice. 
We can believe in Jesus whose redeeming work on the cross was sufficient to provide heavenly rest, or we can disbelieve and miss that rest. In Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, the writer says, So as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the desert. And I would say to all of us today, if you hear the voice of God, maybe even in the chuckles, maybe even in in what I am saying, in your spirit, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. Don't pass that off. Don't harden your heart against God. If there's areas of disobedience in your life that's keeping you from having the peace of God, then be obedient to God and receive the peace that he has for you. Not only is, is there this heavenly rest, but there's also daily rest. Our God understands our needs. In Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 and 15, the writer says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. You see, as this writer is is writing, he's writing to the Hebrew people. He's writing to people whose heritage goes back in the Old Testament as the people of God. And God had instituted a a plan and a method whereby they could worship him and and they could uh, find forgiveness of sin. And in that hierarchy of, of this uh, formula and this plan that God had, uh, there, there was what was known as the high priest. And uh, he had the responsibility of going before God for the people. And he would take the sin offering into the most holy place where the, where the presence of God dwelt among them. And we'll talk more about that. The Hebrew writer will be talking more about that as we go through the book of Hebrews. But uh, the, the high priest, he represented the people. But he didn't always understand the people. He was kind of isolated from the people. But we have a high priest who understands what we go through. We're not talking about a God who's just way out there somewhere and doesn't care about what happens to us. Uh, There there was, uh, in, in ancient times, a, a, a religion that believed in what they called the unmoved mover. In other words, they believed in a God who created everything, but he didn't care what happened to it. That's not the kind of God we serve. But God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And Jesus Christ came into this world. And he understands what it means to be limited to a human body. He, he, he was limited to a baby's body. And as we went through all these time frames of how much sleep each area needs, he went through all of those different areas uh, up to age 33 of, of, of humanity and being limited. God is always everywhere. Jesus Christ, when he was in this world, could only be one place at a time. He, un- he understands hunger. He understands thirst because he experienced it when he was here. He knows what temptation is. He, he knows what pain is and what suffering is and, and what heartache is and what disappointment is. Uh, many times he was disappointed in his disciples and, and their response and sometimes even their, their disobedience. All of the emotions, all of the realities, all the experiences that we have, the Bible teaches us that God that in Jesus Christ experienced all of those things, and yet without sin. And so Jesus is our high priest, and he urges us to find daily rest in him. He understands our needs and sympathizes with us, having been tempted in every way, just as we are, and yet without sin. And remember, Jesus told us to come to him and take his yoke upon, him, upon us to find rest. Because his yoke is easy and his burden is light. In Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30, it says, Come to me, all you who are weary 
and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You see, some people look at, at the Bible and, and, and they miss out on, on all that it says about relationship. The relationship that we have with God the Father through Jesus Christ. And all they look at is, is the rules. And they, they say it's just a rule book. And, and if you're really a Christian, you can't do this and you can't do that. And you have to do this and you have to do that. And that's all that it is. It's just a religion of you must and you can't. But that isn't what it's all about. You see, God created us, and he knows what is best for us. And Jesus came and laid down, for his life, laid down his life for us, and he gives us an offer to come to him and to bring our sin to him and, and to find forgiveness of sin and to be released from the burden of sin and to be able on a daily basis to follow after him and to learn and grow and to become more like him. And the more we obey him, the more rest we have. It, it, it's in our rebellion to God that we struggle. It, it's when we disobey God. It's when, when we follow after our own sinful desires and our own sinful way of doing things that this wrestling match comes in our life. We find this rest when we yield to Jesus. It's not the rules. It's the relationship with him when we trust him to know that his way is best. He beckons us to come and find rest in him. And not only that, but he responds to our prayers. He responds to our prayers. There, there are many tragedies that happen that I've heard Christians say, I don't know how I would go through this if I didn't have Jesus. I don't know how I would make it if I couldn't go to him in prayer. Not only does he have an understanding of what we're going through, but he hears and he responds to our prayers. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, the writer says, Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our times of need. We don't have to face the burdens of this life alone. We don't have to face the trials and difficulties and disappointments of this life alone. We have the avenue of prayer. We can take our needs to the throne of God and there we can receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of prayer. We have a choice. We can pray or we can worry. And you know, too many times by the way we live, we show we would rather worry than pray. But there is a peace, a daily peace that we can experience in Jesus Christ. Why worry when you can pray? In Hebrews 4.16, it invites us to pray confidently, carrying our concerns to Jesus. He understands what we're going through, and he responds to our prayer. If we pray confidently, we will receive mercy and grace in our time of need. On this Father's Day, I'm reminded of a time decades ago when my boys were very small. We were in our first pastorate and over in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, and both of our sons were there. And uh, the church was right next to the house we were living in after our second uh, child was born. We, we lived in the same building with the church when we first moved there, but then later we moved into a house next door. But I would walk home for lunch, and after lunch was over, it was nap time for the boys. And so to try to help them fall asleep, I would lay down on the sofa, and I'd have a two-year-old on one shoulder and a baby, just maybe six months old or so, on the other shoulder, and I would lay there as still as I could until I would actually fall asleep. <laughs> and, and it would never fail that those boys would fall asleep 
As long as I was awake, they wouldn't sleep. But when I fell asleep, they would fall asleep. Well, when Jane noticed that all three of us were sleeping, she'd come and take the baby and put him down, and I'd try to slide out from under our oldest son and, so that he would be there on the sofa, and I would go back to work. So you thought I was going to be on that sofa all afternoon, but that's, that's not the end of the story there. And I would kind of slide out and, and, and go back. But you see, when, when there's a calmness in the father, then there's a calmness in the child. And we have a heavenly father who has everything under control. There's a lot of things in our lives personally and, and in our world today that, that causes us to have great concern and maybe even great turmoil. But you know what? God isn't surprised. And God isn't upset. And God's not wringing his hands and wondering what's going to happen next. We're in a political season to put it, to uh, choose a president, and, and many are wondering what's going to happen, who's going to be the next president, what the, what's going to be the result of that, and, and we have so much terrorism, and it seems like it's increasing, and, and uh, just being safe to, to go anywhere anymore is always a concern, and, and, and there's a concern about that, and maybe in your own personal life, you may have a, a child that's going through a time of rebellion, or perhaps is addicted, or has some kind of a, a problem, and you're concerned. Maybe you're a new parent, or, or a parent of young children, and, and you worry about and wonder, how are, is my child going to turn out? They might be a wonderful five-year-old, but how do I help them get from five to 15 and to 25 without destroying their lives. How, how does, and, and so we have all these concerns. I want to tell you this morning, God is in control. God has the answer. And if we're going to find rest, we have to find our answer in Him. If we really, really believe that God is in control, even in the midst of the turmoil of our lives in the 21st century, we can rest in Him. You see, let's go back to Israel one more time. They were afraid to go into the promised land because even though God had done so many wonderful things for them, delivered them from Egypt, allowed them to cross over the Red Sea, and then saw the Pharaoh and the Egyptian army drown in the Red Sea, they still didn't have confidence that God could take them the next step and take them into the promised land. And I want to encourage you this morning that we have a heavenly father that has everything under control. And even in this world at this time, God is still in control. Do we really believe that? And if we do, then we don't have to worry. We don't have to try to figure everything out. We can rest in him and we can take our needs to God in prayer we have a high priest who understands our need and hears and responds to our prayers. We can hold on to Jesus. And as this Father's Day, I would encourage every father to hold on to Jesus. Hold on to Jesus for your family. Hold on to Jesus in all the things that are going on in this world around us. And this morning, as we draw this message to a close, I would just encourage you, no matter who you are, whether you're a father or not, perhaps you've never asked Jesus to be your Savior. You've never made that decision to follow after him. I want to tell you this morning, it's the greatest life that you can live, to live for Jesus, to know his presence in your life today, to know that he understands what you're facing, and he hears and responds to your prayers, and that there is an eternal rest where you can be with him forever and ever. And if you've never made the decision to follow Jesus, I would encourage you this morning to make that decision today. Turn from your sin and turn to him and ask him to be your savior. Perhaps there are several here today who never asked Jesus to be their savior, never decided to begin to follow him. I'm going to include in my closing prayer a prayer of repentance and asking Jesus to forgive sin. And if you would like Jesus to be your Savior this morning, I want you to pray that prayer with me. 
uh, during the, the, the prayer. You don't have to say it out loud, but just in your heart. You don't even have to say the words. God knows your heart. If you just say, yes, Lord, that's me. That's what I need. Jesus can forgive your sin and be your Savior. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you today that you're so concerned about us and that you've made every provision that we need for every area of life. And Lord, we may be going through struggles personally. We may be going through struggles in our workplace or in our homes. We're certainly going through struggles in our world and in our nation. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to realize that we have a God who's greater than all of these things and you have it under control. Help us to rest in you. Help us to trust in you. Help us to be obedient in you that we may be able to find the rest that you have for us. And perhaps this morning, even in this room, there are those who have never made the choice to follow after Jesus. I ask them to pray with me in their heart as I pray. Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I was born in sin. And I have not only been born in sin, but I have chosen to act in sin. I've chosen to act in rebellion against you and your word and your will. And today I come before you, and not only do I confess my sin, but I repent. I turn around, I turn away from my sin, and I turn to you. And I ask you to forgive my sin and be my Savior. And this day, I choose to become a follower of Jesus Christ. And as I learn and as I grow, it is my desire to live my life the way you want me to live. Thank you for being my Savior and help me to follow you and to trust you in my life. Lord, I pray your blessing upon each one who prayed that prayer and each one that's here today. And Lord, may you send us out to be your people in this world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.